Welcome back to the KDPG Sunday edition. Anyone paying attention to the market these past couple of weeks has seen some dramatic swings. And this past Wednesday, we saw the biggest one day drop for the Dow this year and a sign that a recession could be on the way. But if all the talk of futures and inverted yield curves makes your head spin, let's see if we can't um, at least slow the spinning down a bit. We are joined now by two experts to help us talk through the uh, the turbulence. Dr. Risa Kumazawa is the Department Chair of Economics and Finance at Duquesne University, and Michael Godwin is Chief Investment Officer at Fregasso Financial Advisors. Thanks to both of you Thanks, for Kevin. being here. What is a yield curve? Why is it inverted? Why do I care? Michael, you want to start? Sure. So the yield curve temporarily inverted on Wednesday, a uh, portion of the yield curve temporarily inverted on Wednesday, and that is when the yield that an investor can expect to get from longer dated bonds is actually lower than the yield you would get from a shorter dated bond. So think of it like this. If you're an investor and you want to go buy a CD, a certificate of deposit, you go into your local bank and you say, can I get a rate on a six-month CD and a rate on a six-year CD? In typical times, the rate on the six-year CD is going to be higher than it would be on a six-month CD because you're locking your money up for a longer period of time. Today, however, you go in and you say you see that rates on the six-month CD are actually higher than what you would get on the six-year CD. So it doesn't happen very often. It typically happens towards the end of an economic or a business cycle, and that's what we're seeing, or we temporarily saw on Wednesday. Does it say something about how investors are feeling about the future? I mean, does it say that there's pessimism about the future, that they don't want to invest as much in longer-term bonds? Yes, I, I would say that it is important to understand why the yield curve inverted. If the yield curve inverted because the bond markets thought that global gro or U.S. growth expectations were in trouble and falling off of a cliff, then I would be a little bit more worried. But today, the yield curve is inverted or inverted or, uh, for a moment in, on Wednesday because growth expectations overseas have been very weak and continuing to weaken, coupled with the fact that there is now about $16 trillion worth of bonds globally that are actually yielding a negative interest rate. Okay. The fact that the yield curve inverted but is no longer inverted, right? We're back to where the longer term bond is paying higher interest? So a portion of the yield curve is still inverted. Okay. But the, the main indicator, the one that we look at the most, which is the 10-year bond minus the two-year bond, was inverted on Wednesday, is no longer inverted today. Okay. But it's still, it's still close to zero. All right, Dr. Kumazawa, can we take any relief in the fact that that part of the, the yield curve has gone back to where it should be? Or what is your general outlook on the seriousness of this and the reliability of a yield curve inversion in predicting a recession? So the inverted yield curve um, worries people because the last five recessions, this was a pre precursor to the actual recession happening. And this is why people got worried about the inverted yield curve. So it is, it's reliable. I mean, it's not a, um, one of the major predictors, but it's something that has happened before the last five recessions, which is why um, it's got investors worried. Okay, so even if it happens, then it unhappens, as it has partially. <laughs> Just the fact that it happened is seen as a potentially negative sign. It's one thing to look at. Okay. Um, and I, it, it's important to note that it is, the inverted yield curve is a horrible predictor of when a recession will happen. In the last five instances, it happened anywhere from eight months after the yield curve inverted to two years after the yield curve inverted. So it is not, it is, it is, I think it just signals that the fact that we are in the latter innings of this economic cycle. A recession will happen eventually, but we have no idea when it will happen. All right, Jerry, I'll let you and, and I guess that's one of the things that for a, a regular investor, the, four, the, you know, the, the man or woman with a 401k <clears throat> at work sees 800 points go off the market and goes, holy cow, you know, I'm going to have to work another three years to make that up. Is it really just, was it a market correction? Markets correct all the time. I don't have to, you guys tell me, you're the experts. But that happens all the time. Dr. Kumazawa, that, that was, a, it's 800 points off a 26,000 plus market. Is that just a correction? We were up 100 points yesterday. I don't, I don't know what it is today. But again, both of you, is this a, more a correction? And it's just one blip and, and now it'll correct back up? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to know for the normal investor that puts a few bucks away in his 401 or her 401k every week. I think it's a, a reaction. Maybe in these economic times, maybe it's an overreaction because we tend to see, you know, uh, big swings, right, whenever these, these uh, news comes out lately. So I tend to think it's, it's not something that should really, really worry us, but it, it is a reaction that's happened in the market. 
It depends on your time frame, I think. The default mechanism of an economy is to grow. So over the longer, longer time frame, you're 100% right, it's going to be a blip. Over the shorter time frame, six months or so, I think it definitely warrants to maintain a defensive posture in your portfolios. One of the mm -hmm. things we've done is we've reduced our exposure to international equities, and we've also increased our exposure to low volatility stocks, stocks that typically do better when markets are gyrating like they are today. And we think that, that makes sense for the remainder of the year at least. There's one, one sidebar I want to bring up because it involves what Ken and I do for a living, media. President Trump said the reason why that kind of stuff happens in the economy, you blame the media. He said it, that the media is part of the problem on this. Maybe we are, I don't know. But isn't he, when you talk about we're going to put tariffs on China, ah, maybe <clears> not. <throat> we're going to do a trade agreement, ah, maybe not. Going back and forth like that, is that, that affects world trade, doesn't it? Doesn't that affect everyone's economy when the President of the United States goes back and forth on that idea that the, and, and China's a powerhouse economy in the world? Yes, I'll start with you, Dr. Kubazawa, and then Michael. It's one of our major trading partners, so of course I think that matters mm -hmm. um, because businesses react to what happens when uh, we impose tariffs on our, our, our trading partner, which means that our input prices are going to rise, our product prices are going to rise, so of course it's going to be something that we all react to. And to your point, it, it matters because it, it really affects confidence not only in the consumer, but also in business owners. So if they don't really know what's going to happen with the trade wars, are these going to get resolved? They're not going to invest more monies overseas. They're not going to build out their CapEx because they don't really know what's going to happen. So it can definitely affect it from that standpoint, and a vicious, a vicious cycle can ensue. So uh, the Washington Post on Friday uh, had some interesting quotes. Uh, the National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow works for President Trump. He said, I think it's right to look at what's actually happening. To me, it's a good story. Nobody likes to see market volatility. I get that. You get bears coming out of the woodwork, but we've been through that before. So remain calm. Everything is well. On the other hand, you have Larry Summers, who was National Economic Council Director for President Obama and helped bring an end to the recession, the Great Recession. He said, when the economy turns down, one of the important resources we have, this gets to your question, Jerry, is policymakers' credibility. Quoting, ludicrous forecasts and economically illiterate statements have dissipated the credibility of the president's economic team. Agree or disagree? And I realize I'm putting you on the hot seat, but why not? I think that the, your point on going back and forth is, is very valid here. So when you make statements that really go to the heart of what, what's happening with trade and what's happening with economic policy and monetary policy. Even the Fed Res Federal Reserve Chairman last, in, in December saying we're going we're to go on course and continue to hike rates into 2019 and, and quickly uh, going back on that comments in, in January and now they've obviously cut rates and we're looking for more, more rate cuts in, in 2019. That, ha that does weigh on the economies, that does weigh on markets, that does weigh on investor sentiment and it, it is sort of an issue I think. You can't discount psychology can you? <laughs> Isn't psychology a big part of economics? Yes. Understanding human behavior. Mm -hmm. Let me just read a little bit more from the Washington Post. Administration officials are not planning for a recession because they don't believe one will occur. And, to my point, they worry that even making such plans would validate a negative narrative about the economy and in itself perhaps precipitate a crash. Does that make sense to you? Yes, I think that goes back to sort of what I said in terms of business confidence and CEO confidence and how a, vis a vicious cycle can ensue if confidence really deteriorates. People won't be uh, investing in their businesses, layoffs occur, even if economic data looks okay, but if your confidence is, is shot, then that could be a problem. But there's really no way to prevent a recession. You have to have them. Right. It's part of the cycle. You can, you can soften it, right? And, and, and how do you do that? I mean, that, that gets to Ken's last point that he just read. I, I guess if you're thinking, it's like, how do, if this is coming, we know it's gonna come. When it comes, we don't know. How do you? How can they soften it? Or would, is that what they have to be thinking about now? You know it's coming. We've had, what, what eight, ten years of, of growth? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll take that real quick. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you're right. The business cycle can't be stopped by really any one administration. It, it just, mm -hmm. It's a natural inclination. This has become the longest business cycle on record. And it will end. There will be a recession. The way they soften it, the way the, way the Federal Reserve wants to soften it, is by cutting interest rates now, trying to be proactive and reducing uh, interest rates and making monetary policy a little bit more accommodative. So we're hoping that in the next recession, it's a much, much more mild recession than the one we saw 
certainly going into 2008. Dr. Kamazawa, is that, is that the way to do it? I, mean, I was, types I was also going to say it's probably going to be an expansionary monetary policy to try to stimulate the economy and, and get confidence back. Let me ask you, Dr. Kumazawa, for your impression of the global economy. We have, the, we have many pressures, and obviously we don't live in a vacuum. So we're affected by what happens in Europe. We're affected by Germany uh, contracting, the UK in trouble, Brexit, who knows how that's going to affect things. Brazil, Mexico, economies are shrinking. What's your impression of where we stand, and are we on the brink of perhaps a global recession? It, it does worry me that our trading partners are experiencing a, a downturn because that means that our exports are going to be going down as well. So this is going to impact our economy. So because we live in a global economy, we can't avoid we can't you know avoid having a recession here when others are experiencing downturns. Does it look to you like we are headed for a global recession? We could be. Okay, I really you don't want to say it because <laughs> that will affect the way people behave. All right. Uh, what's the most hopeful thing? Well, let's end with some hope. It's been kind of a dark program here. <laughs> what's the most hopeful thing, Michael, that you see on the horizon in terms of the economy? And in terms of people's you know, 401ks, which are very volatile right, right now. So the U.S. economy itself is still in an okay position. We are by far the best, the best house in a bad neighborhood when you look at it from a global standpoint. Um, so I, I think that is probably what investors should take solace in, especially if you're living in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. Now, I think from a, a trade standpoint... Real quick, sorry. Right? Quickly. Just oh, yeah, from a trade standpoint, uh, if President Xi and President Trump are both in precarious situations with Hong Kong and with the, the elections coming up next year. So I think if we can resolve that in, in, a, in a great way, that, that should be a benefit to the, to the markets. Very good. Thank you. We'll take a break. Be back to wrap things up in just a moment.